All right, welcome everyone. We're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we're here, of course, for a podcast. It's number 22. 22. Yes. Yeah. And we are talking about The Force Awakens. That's right. Originally, we did say that we were going to do the... Uh, the sequel, sequel trilogy. trilogy for this one, but uh, but there is no trilogy yet. Yeah, it's, it's just, just two videos. It's just two two, episodes, two movies. So, yeah. and uh, this would give us also some time to uh, go into uh, Rogue One uh, for next week, which would be Rogue One. Yeah, Rogue One. Yeah. Oh, but uh, with with what The Force Awakens did well in particular, uh, this movie was it had a lot of hype built up to it, and it a lot did of, indeed a lot of expectations that basically said, okay, this better capture the right. The feeling and the spirit of Star Wars, and it, it, also add you know something new. And I would say that generally speaking, it did both quite well. Yeah. Now before we get too in depth into all of that, we do have to give a shout out to our patron. Yes, Stephen of the long of the week, Stephen yes. Long. He is a VIP member. He has been he with us since, awesome. since the beginning of our mm-hmm. patron. Yep, of our Patreon and uh, Stephen, you've done. You're so uh, awesome. Dude. You've done incredible things for us just yep. in the past like six months or so. So we, thank uh, you. we really appreciate you, dude, and yeah. thank you so much for your support. It means a lot. It does indeed. Yeah. All right, guys. So but with that being Force said, Awakens. Force Awakens was a movie that when it came out, yeah. it really, it really hit all the notes yep. of a typical Star Wars movie mm-hmm. in most ways really well. In some yep. ways, some ways that. May not have been the best didn't, thing. Didn't quite like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, a lot of, like, like I don't know about you, Kill, but I get the feeling a lot of people hate on the new Star Wars movies because it's like cool to hate on them, right? It's, when, it's when one of the it's things like that actually it's, it's, really great movies. It's it's something that we've talked about is that you can't recreate perfectly the magic of something that came before, right? Even if what came before wasn't perfect, it was yeah. still just really good. And, and the original trilogy was really well, but what The Force Awakens did was it recaptured yep. uh, that initial experience of going right. into a Star Wars movie for new fans yeah, that because... would then go back and become Star Wars fans of the right. whole thing yep. uh, because of this movie. And I think that... Uh, that goal, if that was what Lucasfilm, Disney, and J.J. Abrams, and Kathleen Kennedy, and they, all them, they nailed it. They yes. hit it out of the park. Yeah. This, this movie was a great relaunching point exactly. for uh, yeah. Star Wars as a franchise. Because here's another thing. It's not just that it needed to like be Star Wars to people who haven't seen Star Wars yeah. before, but it also needed to cleanse our palates from the prequels. Yep. Because the idea of new Star Wars movies, like when we first heard about them, a lot of people were like, Oh no! Is this gonna be like you know one, two, and three all over again? Like, mm-hmm. was kind of skeptical. And right. the fact that even if it wasn't super original, right. it hit those notes really well in a way right that made us gate. open to being like, Star Wars is back. Right. Yeah. What's gonna happen next? Yeah. And uh, they even were a little bit on the nose with some of the palate cleansing with regards to the prequels. In the yeah. very first line of the movie is. This will begin to make things right. Yeah, yeah, which yep. is one of the most on the nose. Don't worry, <laughs> no, we aren't going all. to uh, uh, bring back the exactly. prequels uh, in any uh, yeah. in a straight up fashion. They almost could have just looked straight at the camera at that moment, right? And that kind of is the real point of the Force Awakens. It, it kickstarts the new Star Wars era. Exactly, it brings in a new cast of characters. Yep. It brings us into a new conflict that feels familiar. But is treading some uh, some some ground that we haven't seen before. Right. It, it sets um, things up so that it can be different, but starting on that familiar territory, so that right. we're we're rooting for it moving forward. Exactly. Yeah. And like George Lucas, uh, he was a visionary with 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 what he did create out of Star Wars. It, it rhymes very well with the original and the prequels in, yes. in different ways. Right, so it can be a fresh thing for the people who aren't familiar with Star Wars for some reason. Right, and, and a nostalgia then also trip. A total nostalgia trip for the people who loved Star Wars and yes. were like, we want to get more of what we didn't really get in the prequels. Yep, exactly. And that, that when we get into like the nitty gritty of the story itself, the pacing Star Wars adventure feel is, is top notch. Is top notch. Like, you can tell this was made by a Star Wars fan. Right. Like, because the, even though, again, 
It's not super original. Every beat of the journey, I remember when I first watched The Force Awakens, mm -hmm. I was completely swept along with it. That's yeah. why I think so many people watched it so many times. It wasn't just because it was the first Star Wars movie right. in a really long time, even though that was a, a huge bit. Mm -hmm. It's that it, it really was just an adventure. Yeah, and the way they uh, have the specific intervals of introducing new conflicts, new characters, new set pieces, and kind of connecting them with high kind of octane action mm -hmm. or more kind of uh, sweeping camera shots of massive, uh, beautiful visuals. Uh, the movie really kept you moving along. It never really slowed up. Nope. Until, like, maybe a little point where they started introducing Death Star 3.0. Right. And that, even that, they kept to a very minimal amount yep. to where the adventure wasn't uh, lost. And I think one of the key points of keeping it in this sense of adventure mm -hmm. is that they made it very personal. Like, like if you compare The Force Awakens to, say, yeah. like, Rogue One, that can be one of the, one of the ways where it's super obvious... But right. they very much just like followed individual characters as they went around and, and, and did things. Absolutely. As opposed to, you know, doing like these massive battles. Even when there were battles, it was like X Wings and TIE Fighters, not, right. <laughs> you know, massive spaceships and things. Totally. Uh, next thing I wanted to bring up was the acting in this movie is leagues above yeah. uh, a lot of the acting we've come to experience in a Star Wars yeah. film. Yep. And this is something that's, I'd say, a little bit subtle because. We kind of expect, okay, it's, you know, it's modern, you know, kind of setting. We have a massive assembly of actors and actresses to bring in for a potential right. Star Wars film. And they're Everyone and their mother's brother wants to exactly. be in a Star Wars yep. film. And they're going to make sure that they do a good job acting. You know, the direction is going, they're going to make Absolutely. sure it's on point. Absolutely. But these actors and actresses had a had a lot to live up to they did. and they were bringing a lot of them in amongst some of the returning cast right which has got to be really intimidating for uh people like daisy ridley who played yep. ray uh people uh like john boyega who oh, yeah. played finn uh putting them next to people like harrison ford exactly and having them still hold their own when it came to acting out their crucial yep. scenes i i really love Finn's charisma whenever he's on screen. He he really does a good job of Oh yeah, or Ray's sense of wonder. Yes, like, Ray's it, sense of, they, of wonder, <sighs> but also kind of kind of uh, naive innocence when it comes to specific things. Yeah. But then having the sense of mind to know exactly what needs to be done in very mm -hmm. specific situations. And then of course uh, the playoff of the acting yeah. amongst all these crazy things happening around them to uh, the silly things that BB-8 does oh, to yeah. uh, yes, yes. you know explosions and crazy you know dog fights and battles and such. Uh, it, it was it was it was a good addition yeah. to the Star Wars cast to bring on um, those. And that's not even bringing up people like uh, Adam Driver who did who did a, yes. in my opinion a fantastic. I job thought it did Kylo too. Ren. Yeah. Um, um, now one of the things that I would say we get into the more of the specifics. More here. of the specifics. So yeah. Ray's whole arc of discovering the force right a lot of people don't like it because they say oh she seems like a mary sue but i thought it was fantastic because in in a new hope mm -hmm. when when luke discovers the force they can have these more subtle things of like being able to block you know little blaster bolts from the the training remote and, and right. you know seeing with the with the with the blast shield down and stuff yep. like that but because of how things have sort of escalated over the years mm -hmm. in just, you know, effects and things like that, those kinds of things wouldn't have had the same effect now. They wouldn't. It wouldn't have instilled that sense of wonder and things like that. But having having all these things start happening around Rey as she's mm -hmm. discovering the Force, it felt magical. Right. There was also a very literal passing of the torch, which happened well, yes. with uh, Luke's lightsaber being yeah. essentially passed on to her. And while I would say that there's a lot of The Force Awakens that's a you know a relatively decent nitpick in regards to its over-reliance on fan service, which we'll talk about yeah. later, uh, Rey's character feels like a character who could have a semblance huh, of Luke or Anakin yep. or some of these wide-eyed you know kids in the Star Wars universe who are, whoa, I'm the main character, but I'm you know I'm trying to discover what is all this stuff that I'm, yep. I'm being thrust into here. Ray feels a little bit more uh, 
a little bit a little bit more ready for some of this, but she's not accustomed to seeing the Star Wars universe. She right. uh, feels a lot more, you know, excited and open about these new experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet when she's thrust into conflict and such, she really has a deep connection to those that are close to her. And when that comes into play with her discovering the Force, she instantly reels back from it because it's something that uh, has right. a lot of other emotions attached to it that these wide-eyed, wondrous experiences don't mm-hmm. give her. So right. it was a nice contrast as well. Yeah, that, that really... Well said, because like Ray was, Ray was the perspective character for the audience in yeah. a lot of ways because she was filled with wonder and all that stuff, just like we were at being yeah. able to go into Star Wars again. So when there is that contradiction where she, you know, just pulls away from the Force, we're like, no, don't do that. Yeah. So yeah, in was, some way, it, it it kind of hypnotizes her when she goes down the steps in Maz Kanata's mm-hmm. little uh, yep. cantina place. But then once uh, she gets close enough to touch it, she has the vision, Mm -hmm. and we hear Obi-Wan's, these are your first steps. She rejects it completely. Yep. And I would say that's probably one of the most heartbreaking and beautiful scenes is basically her going from there to being uh, eventually captured Mm -hmm. by Kylo Ren. So, So very good stuff. And one other thing. So, so that was that could be considered one of the aspects of the hero's journey with the initial mm-hmm. rejection of the of the call of destiny, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And I would say this was done much better than actually the rejection in a new hope because Luke's rejection in new in a new hope is oh I have responsibilities here and things like that, which is actually contradictory to what his desire was exactly because he wanted to get out of there and right. join the uh, rebellion and, exactly yeah. so this the, the fact that they made it be something that had much more emotion behind it mm-hmm. was really something that was that was special right and of course there is the aspect of the hero being swept into the conflict regardless of their choice exactly because of you know ray being captured by uh Kylo. Kylo. Yeah. So, yeah. Ends up working out. Uh, next thing, we have to talk about the presentation of The yeah, Force Awakens. Because, because they like, killed it on the visuals, the soundtrack, totally the sound design, mm-hmm. uh, the costumes, sets, yep. uh, everything. Those things are not what make a movie, mm-hmm. but they certainly don't hurt. Oh, <laughs> I would say these are the kind of things that the technical people, the ones that are actually involved in a lot of the behind the scenes would say these are the make or break things of the film. We oh. look at things like story primarily and think well, that's yeah, the main that, thing okay. that makes a movie. That is a good But point. actually it's all this background stuff that we don't pay attention to right, until exactly. a rewatch. Yes, it, it helps keep you immersed in the story. Because yes. especially with a story like The Force Awakens, right. where it's very much this adventure that takes you from place to place to place and it's just this mm-hmm. this ride. Yeah. If they didn't have those visuals to keep you so engrossed in it, right. it would have felt strange it would have and the fact that we so yeah. didn't notice them with the exception of like the really standout moments means they did their job and they did it really well yeah there's a couple of moments that i just want to shout out here we have the star destroyer panning over in the very beginning scene showing it from the planet's kind of surface and uh, well more from the planet's upper atmosphere we have the shot of the canyon rifting apart yep, with yep, Kylo yep, and uh-huh. Rey on the opposite sides. Yep. We have the costumes for the creatures in Maz Kanata's uh, oh, yeah. palace. Yeah, from the, uh, yep. Those were fantastic. Uh, the sound of a lot of the First Order's new weapons that they have on their ships sounded just better. They like, sounded terrifying. Yeah, like, like yes. And that, that was one of the things that I thought was really great because... Mm-hmm. Since they were sort of pulling the idea of the Empire and bringing like it back, the remnant of the Empire, the remnant yeah. of the Empire and bringing it back in the idea of the First Order. Well, one of the issues is that with time, since you know it's been a long time since the original Star Wars trilogy, right. the stormtroopers become more of a joke than anything that's intimidating. Yeah. So the fact that they redid the the Tie Fighters and the stormtroopers, not just in like their their looks and stuff, mm-hmm. but in how their their weapons sounded and yeah. everything. That that it, really it felt like lot. everything got a visual upgrade that made sense with the time skip within the story. Right. And then of course also we have to talk about the OST having very powerful moments that were John Williams uh, is amazing. Poignant. Like um, there's a part where the sound of the music really disappears with uh, a certain scene that we're about to get into very soon that's well, yeah. very heartbreaking. Yes. And then the music comes back all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. 
Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's talk. Let's yeah, just let, talk about that okay, right so, now. Yeah. So so <laughs> that okay. <laughs> Not a lot of the time will I watch a Star Wars movie. Very rarely, in fact, and actually get emotionally compromised. Like, well, right. It's I, I I totally get what you're saying, but like I, I would say that. I do get emotionally compromised at the littler things, but you're talking about like the deep. Yeah, exactly. Like like, like, like Star Wars is tear your heart out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you will always be uh, like emotionally invested, in, or I I will at least. Yes, emotionally invested in stuff. But when they they take that and then they're like, okay, now we're gonna now we're gonna cause some pain. We're gonna stick you where it hurts. Like, oh man, the. That scene was just so good. Like even even yeah. on the rewatches, like second, third, fourth time, it's still right. like I'm starting to tear up. Like, oh, yeah. When uh, when Kylo and Han had their confrontation on the bridge, we knew that this couldn't end well. Yeah, and that. But once <sighs> once uh, once uh, Han started to talk to him. Uh, like a father to a son, we mm-hmm. saw something complex, and we saw something yes. unique that we haven't really seen in either a Star Wars antagonist or a Star Wars protagonist. Nope. Someone who acknowledged the darkness in the other, but had a sort of a yeah. a paternal like, well, I need you to mm-hmm. put this down and stop. And the kid in this instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, having that I can't really let go but I'm trying to yeah in the Return of the Jedi it was the opposite exactly yeah. well and and here's the other thing it's not just that it was the flip side of the relationship right, right. the son going to the father but it was the idea that and this is this is one of the biggest things that I had a problem with in Return of the Jedi mm-hmm. is that when Luke is asking Dar- you know Darth Vader his father to basically turn there doesn't seem to be as much conflict behind it, and that, and maybe that was that was right. set up that way properly because he started as Darth Vader, he didn't start as his father, right? Right. But in this case, because Ben started first as Han's son, and yeah. now he sees how he is now, right? When when he's telling him, you know, take that mask off, you don't need it, you know, mm-hmm. what do you what do you think you'll see if I do the face of my son? Like there's yeah. there's pain in there, there's emotion mm-hmm. behind that. <sighs> Yeah, that was a really powerful scene. I think a lot of people rewatched the movie just for that yeah. scene to be seen again. Yeah. <laughs> scene to be seen again. Uh, next thing, I, I really want to bring up a specific character that oh, just yeah. really... I think a lot of people weren't sure about right. because he doesn't fit into the exactly. archetype of yep. previous Star Wars characters. And in fact, they, they specifically made us think that he was going to be in yep. the trailer... By giving so, him a lightsaber. By giving him a lightsaber. But, but no, Finn, Finn was great. Finn was probably one of the best characters in The Force Awakens as far as introductions. I would oh, say, yeah. I would oh, say yeah. he beats out Rey. He definitely beats out Poe. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Kylo, Ren. Yes. I would say he beats out as well. Because, yep. like, he had... And he, then, of course, you have the original cast, which I wouldn't really compare him to Harrison right. Ford. Because because it's, it's what they started out with. Like, right. Harrison Ford, it's like okay, yeah. There's so much other stuff that you're bringing into yeah, yeah. into the movie for him, but, but just with, for the new characters. Yep, Finn's uh, motivations were so clear, like the entire time. Mm-hmm. Like with Ray, it focused on her a lot more. Mm-hmm. But Finn, like, like yeah. you could you could empathize and sympathize with him. Yeah, he he, he was a really strong character to bring mm-hmm. into the story, and I think a lot of of expanded universe and just other kind of show things have dealt with the idea of the Empire having people that wavered yeah. in their loyalty to that. But mm-hmm. because this was something new, this is a remnant of the Empire. This is not exactly a one-to-one cloning haha, of the Empire. Yeah. We dealt with the fact that he was, you know, brought up to be a soldier and, you know, like he said in the trailer, mm-hmm. I was raised to do one thing. Yep. And now I've got nothing to fight for. Exactly. So and, and you know, we have the the kind of the hero the conflicted hero with no cause, and when he gets introduced to people like Ray, a BB-8, mm-hmm. eventually to Poe and Han and Chewie, he gets swept up into this idea of I can do some good yes. with my life, and he kind of is the everyman 
Right. But then he has all this uh, all yeah. this added personality. Yeah, he has his own kind of hero's journey in the story, yes. despite the fact that he doesn't have the Force. Right. Which so, is like, so refreshing. It's, it's, it's so refreshing because yeah. the whole idea of, like, say, Rey rejecting the, the call of destiny, right, right in, initially, that makes sense because it's this mystical thing that's strange and you don't yeah. understand it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas with Finn, he initially rejects the, the call of destiny very much so when he knows the variables he know like he is he is intimately familiar with the variables and he's like no i am not doing that right which like that that made him way more endearing to me because right. because it made him not fall evenly on one side or the other and he right? even has his moment like you said in the middle of the movie whereas uh raises more uh actually there was there's are both at the around the same time where they reject it uh, Finn's uh, basically seeing that you know we can't fight the first order we have right. to run exactly and uh, that that moment for him to do what no other real Star Wars hero other than Han yep, yep. at the very end of A New Hope has done of ah, I'm out of here I'm gonna cut my losses uh -huh. take what yep. I can and exactly. just book it to the outer rim you know uh -huh. yep. uh, I, I like that you can't place Finn into any of the previous archetypes of any right. uh, character yep. uh, in a one-to-one -one comparison, and even where he comes close to Harrison Ford in the previous one is not like it's not comparable. They're, yeah, exactly. They're, they're for one, totally different. For one, Harrison Ford does a does a better job at other things that than Finn does, but there's also just not a lot of crossover other than you know certain aspects of their personality right and, and I, very I think, certain aspects i think that's a good point to bring up is that you know while we might criticize the for the force awakens for being a little bit unoriginal uh finn was pretty original yeah yeah and yeah. right because yeah even if the plot wasn't original the characters were done really really the characters well. were done really well yeah all right and that speaking of jj abrams that brings us perfectly into the jj abrams mystery box yeah the, and if you don't know what we're talking about look up jj abrams mystery box on uh ted talks yes it, uh, it is you awesome. will have your mind blown to yep. figure out why jj abrams stories are very compelling yes but also don't necessarily have the best endings right so this is where i would say the force awakens had a lot of its mixed bag stuff is that there are a sure. lot of mysterious elements about the force awakens with no uh real payoff right and the thing is if you can if you consider the fact that this is supposed to be the first part of a trilogy right, right and and you 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 completely separate the last Jedi from this, right? The right. fact that the fact that the mysteries didn't have a suitable payoff for a lot yeah. of people that does not change how good the Force Awakens was. No, in fact, because it can sometimes add to it. Exactly, because mm -hmm. those kinds of mysteries are exactly what the first like the first act in an overarching story should do. Right. It's a lot of what A New Hope did actually yep. when mm -hmm. Obi Wan was starting to bring up things and kind of exposit the story to Luke. He would tell him things that we got no real payoff as to what those nope. proper nouns or to really what nope. even the force is right. until the next movie or for yep. some of them until much, much later. Uh, but with The Force Awakens, we brought in the First Order mm -hmm. as kind of the as the first conflict. We don't know exactly what their what their whole deal is. We nope. know that we know that they are a remnant of the Empire, but we don't know why they exist what yep. this Snoke character is that leads the whole thing. Nope. Why Kylo, you know, turned, exactly. for instance. Where Luke is, who Rey's parents are. You know, right. there's there's so many things that they set up to basically... What happened in between the three Yeah, what years. happened in between, exactly. Why are How, Han and Leia not together? Yeah, why are Han and Leia not together? Why is the First Order in, seemingly in power rather than the New Republic? Mm -hmm. Why is Leia a part of the resistance, not just a mm -hmm. part of the New Republic army or something? Right, yes, exactly. Like, there are all these things that are brought up that get us engaged into the story and ask yep. questions, but one of the powerful things about the mystery box is you don't actually have to bring the story to bear on any of those right. things. You just execute a story with those things just kind of hovering in the background. Yep. And yep. unfortunately, I just want to pull this out of there, bring it, be a little bit meta about with things regarding The Last Jedi. I feel like what people did is they misinterpreted why Abrams did does the mystery box in general and yes. went hard deep into all of these theories on very specific background elements of the story mm, for yeah. you know that yep. purpose. And I, I would say that for you know some of the criticisms, in fact, a good 
chunk of them are very well warranted. Uh, one, one of the things you need to realize is why, why the mystery box is done in the story. Yep. It's to make the, uh, the surrounding narrative uh, extremely compelling right. because you yeah you don't have you don't to <laughs> solve the mysteries for the mystery box and that's something mm-hmm. that's you know again watch the J.J. Abrams TED talk yeah. on the mystery box because one of the things he talks about is how a lot of times yeah. having the mystery still be unsolved is more enjoyable yeah. than a resolution because it always it will always be better in your head than whatever someone could come up with right. Exactly. But, yeah. And uh, I would say that's that leads us into a thing that J.J. Abrams brought into this yes. that I would say has both a good and a, a negative side to it, which we'll right. discuss later. But there's actually a lot of tasteful fan service. Yes. Like, yeah. like, you can tell that this movie was made by a Star Wars nut. Like, <laughs> like they just love Star Wars. And even though maybe he relied on it a little bit too much, yeah. those moments where he brings in those homages to the original trilogy, yeah. they are executed near flawlessly. Well, like, they're executed quite well. And when you awesome. get in... When, yeah, I would say that, like, when you get into the whole topic of fan service, there's very rarely anything that's ex- executed flawlessly. Okay. But there's a lot of good, good polished execution with things. I would say that Han is dripping with the fan oh, yeah. service with every moment he's on screen. Yes. I would say just having Han and Leia speak to each other at that one moment where the transport mm-hmm. lands is very, very tasteful fan service. Oh yeah. Because it's something that we wanted, but it's something that once it's happening, you realize you get to breathe. You get to have this moment of, oh wow, these people are different. Mm-hmm. And yep. there's that there's that element of other things are being Escorted into the story with fan service as being the the introduction to that, right? And I feel like fan service should be used more in that way, where you have maybe a hard plot element that needs to be, you know, basically delivered to the audience, mm-hmm. but you don't have a way to do it without basically warming them up to it. Exactly. And fan service is one of the best ways yep. to uh, to do that. And then there's things which are almost a little bit fourth wall breaking. But we still kind of like laugh the, at them. The Millennium Falcon. Like, the jump will have to do, and then they pan but over that the was, Millennium Falcon. Oh, but that was so good. Like, I mean, like, it yes, was it's, cheesy. It's, it's but cheesy, that's, that's but it's the good cheese. It's the good cheese, yeah. Uh, uh, and then the last thing uh, is something that I feel like I didn't yes. hear a lot of people talk about is The Force Awakens had great had dialogue. Good dialogue. Yeah. And, you know, kind of the banter kind of thing. Right. That I would say Star Wars was good on the banter in general. Yes. In general. I would say the prequels yeah. took a hard nose dive in a couple right. areas with regards to uh, dialogue and banter, but but even the in Force the Awakens, original trilogy, like oh yeah yeah, even in the original trilogy, there were some serious dialogue problems. Yeah, and I'm not talking about the acting or the delivery right. of said dialogue. That was fantastic. I'm talking about the dialogue itself when right. taken and you look at it. Yeah, because one of the things in a story is you generally don't look at the dialogue out of context or even you know in its surrounding context. You kind of just let it wash over you. Unless it's really good or really jarring. And right. I need to say that The Force Awakens had some of the best dialogue in yep. Star Wars ever. Yeah. Like, it, it, yeah, it, it really one was. One of good. the best. Yeah. Like a lot of the a lot of the flack that I would say The Last Jedi gets and in, in like a lot of the more recent like right. Disney Marvel movies is because they've realized how awesome it is when there is great dialogue yep. in their movies. Mm-hmm. So they end up focusing on it too much and kind of trying too hard. Right. And they'll sometimes make that's where some of the bad humor comes exactly. from. Exactly. But The yes. Force Awakens did not have that problem. The Force Awakens did not have that problem because I would say JJ Abrams he understands how to do character interactions not on like Joss Whedon level yeah but but pretty high level and I would say that's something that he did uh, quite well when you look at scenes where Han and Chewie are interacting with the pirates yeah and yeah you think that, about that the whole conversation right you think about uh, you think about little little moments where the dialogue has these pauses of emotion that are very intentionally put in there, mm-hmm. where Han is trying to ask Rey if she'd like to join the crew and be on the ship and stuff. There's this, yeah. there's this real yeah. heart behind it. Oh yeah. And then even when the banter comes into play, and it's like you said, like, uh, uh, well, well, like I was saying previously, with Han and Leia there, and they're about to have their conversation. There's just this pause, mm-hmm. and it's like, yep, you changed your hair. <laughs> that and, was so on the nose. 
<laughs> like like there's 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 moments like that where they get into the like the fan service bit, but you can feel a lot of the character coming out in the dialogue beyond just the yeah. uh, just the needed things that need to be stated for the plot to move right. forward. Yeah, even the non-verbal stuff. Like, yeah, like non I am stuff. a big fan of BB-8's little like. Yes, <laughs> that's dialogue as far as I'm concerned. He's like, no problem, buddy. <laughs> yeah, uh, Finn that really, Finn really carries his dialogue quite well. Yeah, I would say the one person that probably, uh, probably struggled the most with dialogue was uh, Kylo Ren because he's one of the one of the more different types of characters sure, we've seen yeah. in Star Wars. So it was probably harder to write for him to have his dialogue uh, right, really make sense. Because it's, it, it doesn't really become powerful until he's at the Han exactly. and yes, him yes. seen at the bridge. But before that, he's dealing with underlings. And yeah. He's you know, dealing with Snoke or Hux. Yep. And it's not it's not as powerful. But all the other characters have, have fantastic dialogue written for them. So yep. props to you, J.J., you uh, and the rest of you your creative really writing good. team or what have you yeah. deserve some praise for that. Yeah. So guys, this is the part where we shift into the nitpicks. Yeah. And a lot of these are nitpicks that we don't agree with. Right. Now So we're going to state like, you know, our counterpoint to a lot of right. these nitpicks, but some and of them we are going to agree with. Yes. And and one important point is that we're going straight into nitpicks. The Force Awakens didn't really have much as far as fundamental problems with the movie. There's the first nitpick we'll mention, which is which is the closest, the closest to a fundamental to that. problem, but it's not as bad as when you think about it. So let me right. let me get into this one real quick. The plot is unoriginal. Yeah, there's no. We have a third that. Death Star. Exactly. And I think this is the main problem with the film. But when we discussed it, it's primarily a nitpick. Yeah, because if you think about it. We haven't had Star Wars in a long time, mm -hmm. and the Star Wars that we did get before that was the prequels. Yep. So we have to basically set the tone and say, no, we remember what made Star Wars Star Wars, why everyone loved mm -hmm. it so much to begin with. The and characters, the adventure, the exactly. heart, yep. the, uh, the, the tension. Right. The, uh, and in order to focus on journey. that, yeah. in order to focus on that, they basically said, we're going to make the plot be something that you're very, very much familiar, familiar with. with. It's yeah. not going to be anything special, right? Just to keep that sense of familiarity, that way we can because, set the stage for what's to come. Right, because the prequels are proof that making a different structure of plot does not necessarily make a good Star Wars film. Exactly. And does not necessarily make even a good film. Right. So that's uh, that's something that we feel like is warranted, and it is a knock against The Force Awakens from being one of the greatest Star Wars movies ever. It's 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 nowhere near original you know original trilogy probably in terms of uh, overall quality. But it is certainly a good movie. But it is certainly a great movie. Yeah. Um, the next thing is uh, is a nitpick that I feel like we both generally agree yeah. with as well, which is the over reliance on fan right. service. It was it was done very well, but it was done a bit more than needed. Yeah, I would say that you could t cut out about half the fan service, and it would do a lot for the movie as a whole. Some of it was particularly for humor. Other bits were kind of points where we felt a little bit pulled out of the film, and uh, if you you know were to look at the fan service moments that don't escort the plot along, but are mainly there for either humor's sake or to kind of poke at the audience, uh, right. but solely for that, yes, the ones exactly. that do escort some of the story along, they should be involved. Still and also, the, uh, I would say even movie. even the fan service that is basically um, an homage to the original trilogy that is not just there for being that. Right. Right. Because having that in there is very good because we do want to see Star Wars again. Right. Right. Um, they just they didn't they didn't need to do it quite that much. But I, I for one, like you might have been jarred, but I, I was never actually brought out of the story of the Force Awakens. The right. whole way through, I was just right in there. Yeah. Uh, this next bit is a, is, is it's a pretty small nitpick, but it's also kind of a, a plot thing that feels a little yeah. bit weird and janky. The the New, New Republic? Republic? What? Like oh, I guess they're gone. Yeah. Oh, who cares? Like like so no one at least with Alderaan in a New Hope when yes. it gets blown up, mm -hmm. you have a character, a single character mm -hmm. at the focal point. Like they are they are very much focusing on her. In fact, in the plot of the movie, they are doing it simply to cause an emotional reaction yep. from this character. 
And it works. And it works. Yep. But in The Force Awakens, when they destroy nope. the New Republic, I didn't even really know that the New Republic was a thing. I they, was like... They, they basically tease it in the title crawl, and that's it. Yep. And, and the other reason that th- this is a problem, more than just it being like a we don't care when they get blown up, right. is that it seems to basically redact some of the struggle that the characters mm-hmm. went through yep. in the original trilogy because if the New Republic isn't important right now, if it's just a throwaway thing, mm-hmm. if Leia isn't even a part of it anymore, like, right. w- what's the point? Yeah. You know, so, so that's that's a nitpick that I would say uh, it's a genuine nitpick, but yeah. it's also still a nitpick. It's not an actual negative against exactly. the movie's right. overall uh, right. In the grand scheme thing. of things, it doesn't really matter. Now, all right. Now we're this is get one. To the... This is one that we will we will fight people on. Like, uh, yeah, but I think we actually should do this oh, okay. one as it's a more legitimate nitpick first. Uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, fair we enough. have to talk about Phasma, and this is yeah. the same in the Last Jedi. Yep. She was not marketed correctly. Nope. She should not have been put into the limelight as being anything of a character because right. she is not a character really in this movie. Nope. Nope. In if fact, anything, if anything, they could have cut out uh, a couple bits. I, I know that I know that people like Poe now, but, but Poe, what he had mostly was the charisma of Oscar Isaacs bringing his character back exactly. to the forefront. Yep. I would have liked to cut out a little bit more Poe for a little bit more Phasma. Get, I make them at least actually, equal. I, I would have said that that would have been a great way to set up Phasma is have Poe do his, his awesome thing, you know, yep. have him bring that energy, yep. and then have Phasma kill him. Yeah, that would like, have been really like ballsy. That, that would have that would have been great because Poe was the first character we were introduced to. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, we we're already set to have an emotional attachment to this character, right? Right. Um, Poe's 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 character kind of snuck his way into the film. Yeah. And did. I think it's I think that we're better for it. But Phasma should have either been redacted from the story. Yep. Or, or should have been actually given ample like screen time to be a character. Yeah, we'll talk about that more in our last Jedi review. Yeah, uh, but this next one, I think this is one that people uh, uh, really, really went a little bit too hard into. Yeah, and we could almost just do a whole movie. I mean, a whole video yeah, about this. this but, but we will Rey fight is anyone. Not a Mary that, Sue. Yeah, Ray is not a Mary Sue. Like. So the 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 whole idea of the Mary Sue actually originated in Star Trek fan fiction. Yep. And it was basically where there was a gender bent sort of Kirk replacement yep. who gets along well with all the characters, can yep. do everything better than even the specialists in their field on right. the Enterprise, right? Yep. And anyone who disagrees with the person or has problems with the person, is in conflict with the person, yep. is completely unreasonable about it. And right. it's just over the top and it's grating and it's ridiculous, right? Right. The fact that you have a character Character that is incompetent, even outlier so, like like freakishly competent, is not a bad thing. Yes. It's also not necessarily making someone a Mary Sue. Right. One of the com- things people have conflated towards is if someone has a, that one thing that they're really good at and they're the best at that no one else can do, then they're automatically a Mary Sue or a Gary Stu. Right. Gary Stu is the male, male version. version of that. But the funny thing is, is that you don't hear a lot of people crying out uh, about Poe Dameron being a Gary Stu yep. about his X-wing piloting. Right. And and I think hmm. that and, well, and and that could be the the whole gender thing. But it yep. could also be, and this is and this is where maybe it it could have a bit more. Uh, weight to the argument Mm -hmm. is that Ray didn't have actual training. Right. Right? But... This is the force we're talking about, right? Right. Like <laughs> Luke fought Luke Vader fought Darth with Vader, no lightsaber with, training. Yeah. Like I feel like people forget about that. Right. Is that Luke had no lightsaber training? Yeah. And Rey actually had experience fighting with her staff. Yep. Now yep. I'm and not one to poke into the original trilogy much, but if we're going to call. Ray, a Mary mm-hmm. Sue for either the Force or lightsaber stuff. I have very, very well also, backed arguments for yep, those. Also, the main problem people seem to have is that she was able to defeat Kylo Ren in that final battle. Yep. Let's do a Again. checklist of what Kylo had been through up till that point. <laughs> he killed his own father, which means he would be emotionally, psychologically, right? mentally so, so out of it. Exactly. So he would not be probably using the cold calculating like all the best maybe lightsaber techniques he had or whatever. Yep. He also got shot with a bowcaster, which, which was established to destroy basically anything, anything in a massive explosion. He took it to the gut and he chased after them and kept fighting. Right. He also got slashed by Finn 
Finn. Yes. The real question might be how Finn was able to do that since he had no lightsaber training <laughs> or the Force. <laughs> right. But, you know, that works. And then finally we get to Rey. And then finally who, we get to Rey. Yeah. And who fights against a, uh, a Kylo Ren who is weakened like this. Kylo Ren is still beating her and until that point in where the fight where she taps into the Force. She taps into the Force. Exactly. And anytime anyone in Star Wars taps into the Force and there's a direct moment like that, they always succeed. Right. Oh, here's another thing. <laughs> like, Rey being a Mary Sue, how many times did she get taken out exactly? Let's see. <laughs> Quite a lot. Kylo just immobilizes her with the Force no problem and then just knocks her out and takes her away, right? Tap, you go to yep, sleep. Tap, you go to sleep. When, when Kylo shows up to fight them and she draws her pistol on him, boom, she's out of the fight. Yep. Like, there are Yes, she was able to do the whole mind trick thing and telepathy and all that stuff, but that's strictly relegated to the Force. Right. Like the so, so, so one of the things that uh, a lot of people have brought into The Force Awakens is a lot of, I would say, a lot of expanded universe stuff with regards to how the Force works. If we actually take the movies, and then I would say uh, probably we'd have to take the Clone Wars TV show. Yeah. A lot of the things that we know to be how someone uses the Force and acquires the Force is very vague and unconstructed yep. at this point. And one of the things that I feel like needs to be uh, stated quite well here is that Rey is a self-insert character. Like that, is, right. but that is not a bad. That is not thing. necessarily a bad thing because yes. yeah, because here's the other reason why. A lot, of, a lot of times people have problems with the self-insert main characters mm -hmm. is because they lack emotion, they lack drive, and, mm -hmm. and they're just sort of a, a cardboard cutout placeholder, right? That right. doesn't really do anything. Yep. But Rey absolutely Rey anything does things. But that. She's anything but that. She has, she has probably more emotion than any other character in the sh in, not in the show, in the movie, exempting that one scene with Han and Kylo. Right. So... No, she is no. she's a self insert character, which was something that, that is that is that is overpowered. That is overpowered, but far far from, from a Mary, Mary Sue. Sue. Like, and I feel like people need to go back and do some research on what a Mary Sue actually is before they start throwing the yeah. title around, because it's watering down actually what a Mary Sue is. Right. Because and there, there yeah. are a lot of stories out there with Mary and Gary Stews. Ma yeah, Mary, Mary Sue's Sue's and Gary, Gary Stews, Stews and that, and it's bad. And it's bad. And this very much is not that. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So now that that's that is said, we can uh -huh. move on to some of the sillier nitpicks. Exactly. Uh, we have uh, Kylo, Kylo Ren, Ren the Edge Lord. Lord. Um, so, <laughs> crawling <laughs> in my skin. Yeah. So basically, um, Kylo Ren is, is the moodiest Star Wars yep. character we've seen since Anakin. Right. And the only yeah. real potential, like I would say, legitimate issue with something with with this whole thing is that. Um, you would expect Kylo Ren to be younger if he has this much angst. Right. right? But, but, but his age is a little bit vague. His age is vague, and also the Force is involved, which is something that is supposed to directly, basically... Affect emotions. Affect emotions, yep. especially if you're, you're in the dark side. The dark side. Yep. So, so it's kind of silly to equate uh, Kylo Ren to be a weaker, kind right. of moody... He is totally an edgelord, but like, oh, yes. that doesn't mean he's a bad character. That doesn't mean he's a bad character. In no. fact, I would say Kylo Ren and Adam Driver, by extension, as the one who acted for Kylo Ren... Uh, it had a little bit of had a little bit more contention, I would say, amongst the fandom than even Ray did, because he was kind of the the next evolution of the Star Wars antagonist. Right. He felt kind of he felt more relevant to the times we have now and nowadays. Yes. He was an entitled kid from the perfect legacy right. that had everything going for him right, yep. but decided to edge it out exactly. and turn on them for and reasons which we don't know yet. Right. And when all that's combined with the good acting, the mystery bark mm -hmm. stuff, yep. the powers that he displays, the acting that he displays, the emotion he mm -hmm. displays, yep. it all works. Yeah. It's a perfect package of something that we've never seen before, so therefore right. it makes it a little bit raw for yeah. us, and, and here's but the that's thing. good. And here's the thing. The main, the main problem I think people have with it, in addition to not having really seen it before, because mm -hmm. th this is... This is what Anakin was supposed to be, but yep. it was just done poorly. Yeah. But here's the thing. It's that since The Force Awakens is so similar to A New Hope, mm -hmm. Kylo Ren 
feels like he should be Darth Vader. Oh, and in fact, he yeah. wants to be Darth Vader. And if it was a one-to-one like transfer of all the stuff from A New Hope, he would be Darth Vader. And yeah. he most certainly is not. Yeah, and because Darth Vader was so awesome, yeah, that's right. the point. Because Darth Vader was so awesome, that in turn makes the audience, I feel, be like, oh, he's He's yeah. kind of lame. Which is kind of funny because the audience that critiques Star Wars is wanting to have their cake and eat it by saying like, yep, yep. well, wait, we <laughs> don't like how... This is too similar. This is yeah. too similar to A New but, Hope. But but, but Kylo Ren should be a one-to-one, you know, yeah, yeah, he should he, be more awesome like Vader. It's exactly. like, hmm, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which I one mean, do you really want? I mean, Kylo wishes he was more like Vader, too. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, what Star Wars villain wouldn't want to be more like Vader? Vader but, is the quintessential villain of, of all fiction, basically. basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he's not. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. And this next one is one that I feel like is is really funny. I think it's yeah. the it's, silliest it's final nitpick we Very minor, but um, worth mentioning. R2-D2? Why did he turn on? Why did he turn on at that end? Yeah. Point? Like, and why was he off at all? Right. Can he feel the force? Like, right. What, did, what did was going on? Did he suddenly know when he was needed? Yeah. Did Luke, like, set, like, a timer of, like... Yeah. Yeah. All that, I would say, is basically just one of those minor little plot holes that's, like... Right. Mm, and and here's mm, the other it's thing. It's a nitpick. Here's the other but thing. it doesn't really matter. It could also be relegated to the J.J. Abrams mystery box because yep. it was at the end of the movie. Yep. So there could have been an explanation in the next movie of why he woke up at that time. But then again, it's such a small thing that we realize how small it was once uh, exactly. The Last Jedi comes out and there's no explanation right. for it. Right, and there's no that. explanation because they didn't really need to, but they could have because it was something where they, where it was setting something up for the next work. Yep. So it's not inherently a problem with yeah that movie. Yeah, and I would say that this is a good thing to to bring up. We both like The Force Awakens. Like we both acknowledge lots. that it's not the best Star Wars movie, no. and it probably has no chance of ever changing on our minds to becoming anything close to the best Star Wars film. But if you had to rate it, uh, wh- where would you put it in your list so far of Star Wars movies you've seen? Where would you put it, like, below? What would be above it? Some of the prequels. Or uh, some of the... Some of the- Original some of the trilogy. original trilogy, yeah. Um, but the thing is, I would actually put it very close to the original trilogy mm-hmm. um, because a lot of the because I feel like I feel like e- even though it wasn't original, mm-hmm. some of the execution on a lot of its main points was a bit better than some of the execution of the points in the original trilogy. Mm-hmm. So, I I I probably wouldn't put it above any of them though. I'd probably have it, you know, number four. Like no, because number four is just. Number four is number four. To like, I, I don't know. I don't no, know. No, I was saying number four in your list of all Star Wars. Oh, movies. sure. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, that's probably because I, I would probably put it as like number five or like tied for number five. I, I feel like one of the things that holds back the Force Awakens really is its uh, lack of originality. So my question to you is, which one would you put above it other than the original trilogy? See, that's where it gets a little bit. That's, that's, that's where, where it gets, gets dicey, a little bit yeah. dicey because I am not necessarily willing to put uh, Rogue One above mm-hmm. uh, the Force Awakens. I'm not necessarily willing to put Revenge of the Sith above the Force Awakens. But in some ways, I'm kind of willing to put um, the, last the Last Jedi, Jedi in some oh, ways wow. above. The Force Awakens. Okay. Now, this is where I would say, actually, I'm probably going to say that Force Awakens and The Last Jedi are tied in my head. Um, but if I had to pick one to go above it, it might be Revenge of the Sith. Okay. Um, but it's mostly because of what Revenge of the Sith meant for the Star Wars series as a whole. Sure. Rather than yeah. my actual enjoyment of, of it. Of the movie itself. itself. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a murky area once you get after the original trilogy for me. I could probably yeah. tie Revenge of the Sith, Last Jedi, and Force Awakens all together. That's a little bit of but it's a little bit of a cop out. Yeah. So I would say that it'd probably be below uh, Revenge of the Sith, and it would be um, tied probably with The Last Jedi. Gotcha. But hey, I think that I think that The Last Jedi and Force Awakens are pretty much equal in that regard. So they uh, are like they're they are certainly not bad Star Wars movies. Yeah, like, anyone that says they're worse than Attack the Clones and Phantom Menace, I. I strongly recommend you rewatch those movies. Yeah, because I think you haven't seen them in a while, and that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. I I totally know how the the, the nostalgia lenses work. Oh and yeah, they, they definitely yeah. have been a thing for me, and I've been rewatching the Star Wars mm-hmm. movies recently for these podcasts that we've been doing. Right. 
recently, so it, it feels good to now kind of get everything a little bit more out yes. in the open. But yeah, I proudly love The Force Awakens. Yeah, same here. Nothing same will here. change that. All right, guys. Well, next week we'll be doing uh, Rogue One. Rogue. Yes, yeah, so that'll be a, that'll be a fun surprise for you guys. Mm-hmm. Instead of uh, uh, just kind of being done with it, but also yes. in the meanwhile, before in between that, we'll have a separate uh, review specifically for the Last Jedi. Right. And you guys will get to watch that. And yeah, we'll see you all there for those. But until then, we're semblance of sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we'll see you all next time. time.